Good morning, everybody. I'm Strobe Talbot. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here to another installment of Meet the Press at Brookings with David Gregory. Martin Indyk, who is my friend and colleague and the Vice President and Director of our Foreign Policy Studies Program, and I are very, very grateful to you, David, for bringing your talents and the Meet, Meet the Press brand to what we is, value very highly as a partnership uh, between your show and our institution. We're also delighted that David's mother, Carolyn Surtees, could be with us today. We like to think that we're family friendly here at the Brookings Institution, and we're also, we're also friendly to the diplomatic corps, which is represented here by Ambassador Hofstrom uh, of Sweden. Another thing about Brookings is that books are a very important part of what we do here. They're an important product of the intellectual work that goes on at Brookings, and they are very important to the impact that is part of our motto, which is quality, independence, and impact. The author of the day, Bob Kagan, who was a senior fellow in our foreign policy program, has a high impact mind, and he's had a high impact career. He has made a point over the years of writing some big books on big topics. The example that comes to my mind, because I have read it and learned a lot from it, is called Dangerous Nation. It is the first of what will be two books under that overall title, and it's essentially uh, a, how shall I put it, uh, a history with a point of view of American foreign policy. Uh, I would describe it as a robust and very compelling advocacy of the proposition that quite the con to the contrary of what John Quincy Adams once said, Uncle Sam actually does go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Now Bob also does little books on big topics, or at least short books. And the world that America made focuses uh, on the current debate over whether the United States uh, is, or as he strongly believes, is not uh, in decline. And it has been the subject of a great deal of press attention, uh, as well as uh, getting some attention from the President of the United States, as I think all of you are aware from stories that appeared both pre and post the State of the Union message. Uh, joining us for a discussion of Bob's book is David Brooks. Like Bob himself, David is no stranger to big ideas, to clear and fresh thinking, to muscular writing, and he's no stranger to the Brookings Institution. He's a good friend personally of many of us here, and he's been a good friend to the institution. It was about a year ago that he came to this podium to launch his book, The Social Animal. But now I'm going to turn the proceedings over to David Gregory. Thanks very much, Strobe. I, this is a fascinating topic um, today on the question of, of why the world needs America, America's role in the world, and I think a question of whether America is in decline that is not just uh, the question that's debated in intellectual sessions um, or in, in books such as Bob's. I think it's very much a part of the national uh, debate and certainly the political debate in this country. You know, we measure, as we look at uh, polling data, uh, whether the country's on the right track or the wrong track. And that's such an important indicator of where independent voters are uh, and how an incumbent president is faring in a reelection campaign. And the reality is that as we go through recession and weak recovery in the immediate post-war phase of Afghanistan and Iraq, there is a lot of pessimism throughout America. Economic growth, growth is uh, flat. There are so many problems in the world. Uh, the notion that we fought wars to victory is really in doubt. Uh, the outcome in, in Iraq and Afghanistan remains uh, very much uncertain. Uh, so there is um, a, a sense of pessimism about whether, uh, for many Americans, whether their children will indeed do better than they have done uh, in the next generation. So all of these questions, I think, become very accessible. And the president has, has taken this question head on. And as I introduce Bob to sort of talk about what you'd say is the overarching point of the book, uh, the president in his State of the Union address 
It says, anyone who tells you that America is in decline or that our influence has waned doesn't know what they're talking about. Is he summing up what your book is about? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, he's summing up what about one-fifth of the book is about. And, you know, this is what happens sometimes. And I owe it to the great Leon Wieseltier, uh, the, edi the editor, the literary editor of The New Republic, who selected this part of the book, the we're not in decline part of the book, uh, to excerpt in The New Republic, which then found its way somehow into the president's office. So, uh, but, and, and, I'm, and I'm happy to talk about that, but I must say the reason uh, I wrote the book uh, uh, was my concern that uh, whether or not we are in decline, people, and I mean everybody, not just uh, pundits, intellectuals, policymakers, but the average American, I felt, was a little bit complacent about the idea that the United States was ceasing, would, would cease to be able to play the role in the world that it's played. And so the purpose of the book is to examine, first of all, what are the remarkable, and I think they are remarkable qualities of the international order today that we tend to take for granted. Um, the incredible widespread of democracy. Uh, there were 10 democracies before World War II. There are 115 now the actually remarkable era of prosperity that we've enjoyed since 1950, even notwithstanding the current recession, unprecedented global GDP growth, uh, and finally, the absence of great power conflict, which there have been plenty of wars and plenty of devastating wars, but we haven't had the kind of seismic great power conflict that we saw in World War I and World War II and saw frequently in previous centuries. So there is this remarkable world order, and, and what I seek to demonstrate is this order actually is very much the product of American power, the very much the product of certain unique qualities that the United States brings to the world, not all of which have anything to do with virtue, some of which are just geographic, the, the fact that the United States is alone in a hemisphere and other great powers are surrounded by other great powers, that the United States is actually irreplaceable in this regard. So that if the United States does decline, you get a different world order or you get disorder. So that, that was the main thrust of, of my book. And then, but I felt I had to address the question because I think people would say, well, whether that's true or not, we're in decline. <laughs> so what are you going to do about it? So I tried to push back a little bit on the notion that we're in decline, mostly by pointing out that our, I would say one of the larger arguments I make is that our perception of our past is, is very nostalgic and rosy. Uh, we somehow think that it used to be the case and in fact, this is what people say, we can no longer tell the world what to do. And as you look back on any decade since World War II, I don't know when that was. Uh, even in the first decade after World War II, uh, we, we suffered substantial strategic setbacks, had our influence limited in substantial ways uh, in many parts of the world. So if you ask, are we in decline, you have to say, decline from what? What's the baseline? And in my view, there's nothing particularly about the current system international order that has us in any weaker position than we've been in in the past. The, in, then you would argue what is the central fallacy of those who would argue that we're in a post-American century, or as Thomas Friedman has written, uh, you know, that used to be us, that uh, across the board from education to economic output to global leadership, uh, that we are not what we were and therefore are less capable on the international stage when other countries, like China, for instance, are making uh, uh, more advancements? Well, I mean, there's the question, which I'm sure David will also get into, of, you know, are we the country we were in many respects uh, at home? Uh, is our, uh, you know, is our society the same as it was? Our, is our initiative the same as it was? I think those are important questions. But looking at the issue geopolitically, and saying which power wields the most influence in the world, I don't happen to think that the rise of the rest, which is what the post-American world is about, really uh, necessarily impinges on American, uh, America's power. China's rise certainly can, but one of the things that I try to emphasize is China faces enormous obstacles uh, to become even close to being a peer of the United States, uh, not the least of which is that it is surrounded by great powers, all of whom are themselves dynamic, especially India, and all of whom look to the United States uh, for their ultimate sort of security uh, dependency. And so 
China, and not to mention the internal China problems that China has. When I look at the other rise of the rest, India, Turkey, Brazil, South Africa, does their rise really cut against uh, American influence? Uh, you know, if you think about the Cold War, mm -hmm. Germany and Japan both rose. There was a much bigger rise of the rest then that actually benefited the United States. So these are questions I think you need to look at a little bit more analytically. It's not enough to say, look at how the others are rising. So David, if, if I understand Bob right, if the question is, is America in decline, his answer is, that's the wrong question. You don't think that's the wrong question. Yeah, well, first, uh, I'm going to make that argument. First, first I want to say, the first, my first reaction when I got Bob's book was the amazing design similarity to Jay-Z's book. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I thought it was actually shameless of Bob to rip off Mr. <laughs> Mr. Z. I imagine young rappers all across the world picking up this book and going, you know, American hegemony, what, what's that this that were, crap? Would that that were the case, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, second, uh, I'm going to, I, I fundamentally don't think we're in decline, but I'm less confident in that position than I have been for the rest of my life. So I'm going to emphasize the negative. Uh, on the supposition that if Mitt Romney can go around the country saying things he doesn't believe, I can do it too. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I, think, I think you could make the case uh, that, that Bob presupposes too much that we have this much of a choice. And just on a few things. First, spiritually, and this is, I think, what's at the core of it when, David, you mentioned the number of people who think we're in decline, a lot of it is a sense, as Tom wrote, that used to be us, that we had the va 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 voom. And this was based on a sort of moral materialist eschatological drive that America had from the 17th century onward. And somehow we don't have that work ethic and the Chinese have that work ethic. And then the second thing is just sheer materialism. Oswald Spengler got almost everything wrong. But the one thing he got right, he said to the Europeans, you can afford to have a welfare state or you can afford to be great powers. You can't afford both. And the Europeans chose the former. And you could argue we're in the process of choosing the former. And then finally, the leadership class. In the era when we really did project uh, power, in the different eras when we did, we had a leadership class raised on certain Roman virtues. And they thought of themselves that way. Now we don't have that leadership class. In fact, we had a divided class. So every time a divided leadership class, or every time one party tries to do something sort of grandiose, the other party, no matter what it is, opposes it. And so I'd say, just to start off with, those are three, the spiritual, the the sheer debt problem, and then the leadership class problem all inhibit uh, the sort of policy that Bob's trying to articulate. Well, since I, I sort of take a historical look at, at most of these questions, the question I always ask, and it's not, it doesn't answer itself, but it, it does bear asking, what's actually new? So let's just start with your last point. Um, the elites have frequently been divided about foreign policy. In fact, the story of American foreign policy history is of, delete, of elites clashing. And if you simply look at uh, the rise of the uh, Roosevelt, Theodore Rooseveltian approach to world greatness, that sparked an equal and opposite reaction of anti-imperialists. Um, there was a real war going on between the Republican and Democratic parties until Woodrow Wilson created the synthesis of the two, and then got destroyed. I mean, we're not going to look at the 1920s and not see the same kind of elite warfare uh, over foreign policy. In fact, theirs was much more dramatic, and I would argue devastating, when Wilson goes off and signs um, the uh, Treaty of Versailles, and it's defeated by a Republican Senate on almost entirely partisan grounds. So I just, you know, you have to ask what's new in this situation. By the way, that led to a great disaster in the 1930s, so I'm not saying we can't lead to a great disaster, but then you have, you know, but we somehow came out of that disaster. So that, that's one issue. In terms, I, I, then the question that's more complicated for me is clearly we are uh, having difficulties addressing, for instance, the fiscal crisis, but we're also having problems of, you know, if, if it's true that we don't have the, as you say, va, 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 is that Tom's or yours, va, va, va? <laughs> I think it's actually Greg va, Garbo, va, boom, or no, va, it's... Va, uh... va, va, anyway, <laughs> I, I am interested, and this is something that has not been done, and maybe you're just the guy to do it, or maybe you'll tell me I'm the guy to do it. I'd love to know what the actual correlation between that reality is and the ability of the United States to continue leading. Um, I think we often, we are, one of the things that's happening right now is because we're generally depressed about the state of America, we assume that that somehow translates into global decline. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. It could be true, 
but I don't see any particular, I don't see what the exact correlation is. If we are unable to solve our economic difficulties, which produces a further economic crisis, which requires politically further cuts in our defense budget, that's how I see the correlation. But, I don't, but there's no rational requirement for that to be true, because as I'm sure you'd be the first to acknowledge, our defense budget is not our fiscal problem. Our fiscal problem is entitlements and other things. So you don't have to be taking money out of the defense budget. You don't have to be taking money out of the foreign affairs budget. We can afford our foreign policy. It's only the perception that we can't afford it that is leading uh, in a potentially dangerous direction. Yeah, but if people feel their wages are stagnating, they're going to be much more hesitant to support foreign. You're, you're going to get exactly the nation building at home argument is going to become stronger and stronger. And what you get is sort of a dumbed down Huntingtonianism where it's, uh, well, there's nothing that can be done for those people anyway. Nothing, nothing can be done for those Bec people and overseas. It, which, it, which is essentially the, we want to take care of ourselves. We're feeling economic anxiety. We're feeling a general loss of self-confidence. And so let's not venture out. I, I, and I, I understand that impulse, and we have had that impulse in the past, especially in the 1930s. But uh, we have not really had that impulse uh, throughout since then, unless now we've really reached a, a totally new situation. Because, and it's interesting, um, look at the polls on should we attack Iran if they get a nuclear weapon. In the middle of all this, male this war weariness, we never want to get into another war. James Traub is writing, it's the end of American intervention. If I had a nickel for every time somebody wrote that over the last 25 years, I'd be a very wealthy man. Um, and yet, a majority of Americans still favor, and everyone knows, even if you ask anybody inside either, any of the campaigns, if Obama were to use force against Iran, the election's over. That's what people think. He would, it would be over. He would win the support of the American people overwhelmingly. So, Everything is true except we could be, as far as the American people are concerned, we could be in another intervention within the next year. Yeah. So I, I'm just not persuaded that we have necessarily moved into a brand new era in the way Americans think about well, let me policy. jump in there because I want to sort of break this down between the military, the economic, and the political. And I want to start with kind of the military order. And on that point, is not the experience of Iraq and Afghanistan most recently um, a challenge to the notion of American exceptionalism in the sense that we have uh, an exceptional ability to influence the international order. David, start on that. Well, I guess, I mean, th there are two things to learn from Iraq. One is the, uh, the increasing power of asymmetric warfare, that we have all these carrier fleets floating around, but if IEDs can derail us, well, that's sort of a problem for any great power. Uh, and then the second is just the sheer belief in our ability to get things done. And you know, I supported the Iraq war as much as Bob, but it's still, uh, the way it was conducted was still shocking for me and still caused me to take a much more uh, modest and humble uh, sense of what could be accomplished simply because foreign countries are much more complicated. Our ability to control events is much more complicated. Our ability to get a good intelligence is much more complicated. And, and that Iraq after effect, both in the asymmetric warfare and just in people having confidence that we can achieve these things given the complexity of the world, uh, it seems to me both those are spillovers from Iraq that you know, I'd like to hear Bob deal with. Again, I'm, I'm, well, I'll deal with them by saying again, what, what's new? Um, if you go back and look at the Philippine war, I know you all wanted to talk about the Philippine War, and I had that always in my have list an opportunity. Here, David, that was his yeah. next question. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. We went through exactly the same cycle in the Philippines that we went through with Iraq. We went out there. We thought a that we would be greeted as liberators, and this would just be fantastic. We, after all, did liberate them from the brutal Spanish tyranny that that, that they were under. Then the uh, insurgency crops up, and we're dealing with the insurgency by having a big standing for, a relatively big standing force trying to build hospitals. That, that's what they were doing. And then we discovered that that somehow wasn't helping, and then, they, then we developed counterinsurgency tactics, which, by the way, included some, some brutal methods that we all know about, um, and ultimately put down the insurgency. But boy, it left a bad taste in the American people's mouth, and they never wanted to do it again until five years later they did it again in the Dominican Republic or in you know, half a dozen other places. Um, Vietnam, what did we learn in Vietnam other than our power, military power doesn't accomplish anything, we're ill-equipped to deal with this kind of, and arguably we were, okay? And I think that what Iraq, you know, if we were, 
if we will remove ourselves from the partisanship of Iraq, which really does color the discussion to a very large extent, ultimately the US military was remarkably successful in Iraq. I mean, yes, the surge actually worked. Um, and we had a fairly pacific uh, situation in Iraq, which allowed the president to, I think, prematurely pull out all the troops. Now, we'll see what happens, but is that going to be marked down uh, as a failure of the American military? Probably not. Um, and the fact that we feel it is, uh, it, it may be temporary. I mean, again, the question is, what is the lasting effect? If you had asked anybody in 1975, would the United States ever send troops anywhere ever again, you would have been just as on firm ground making the argument then as you are now, which is to say, not firm ground. Um, <laughs> See, I mean, my, my, my yeah. sense is everything I say, Bob was going to say, you know, John Hayes sat here at Brookings in 1897. <laughs> he said the exact same well, I'm, thing. I'm and sorry to wrong. complicate the issue. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you could say, hey, now I'm going to switch and become Fareed Zakaria. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you could say that in that times, OK, Philippines, uh, trauma, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, the US was still ascending as a share of world GDP. It was, there was still not the other countries around. But now this is different than those historical examples because now that China and India is around and we're not ascending anymore as a share of GDP, we're declining a bit. And so it's different. Well, isn't it also different? I mean, take, take a conflict like Syria where, you know, I remember my father called me and, and said, he was horrified at this notion of massacre on this scale um, and that the world seems sort of impotent to do anything about it. But in fact, um, you know, a, a multipolar world, including the dynamics of the UN Security Council, mean that Russia and China can stand in the way, which goes back to the question of whether that level of influence is what it was, or is your point, Bob, that it simply it goes in cycles? My point is simply that it goes in cycles. And not only that, but the UN Security Council is deadlocked. The UN Security Council has been deadlocked almost since the day it was born. There was a brief moment when we thought, oh, wow, you can go to the UN Security Council and get resolutions. That, that, was, that moment has passed uh, on many of these issues, although they did get one on Libya, remarkably. Um, but then the question is now, and I see even liberal internationalists are saying, well, if we can't get a UN Security Council resolution, we'll go do this with the Arab League, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to say, if you wanted to ask me to bet uh, what are the odds that we may wind up using some kind of military force as part of a NATO operation, as part of some deal with the Turks? Uh, it's not zero. Uh, it's probably significantly higher than zero at the end of the day. And by the way, we are backing into intervention in Syria the way we have backed into every intervention of the past 25 years. When the President of the United States says Assad must go, that carries implications, which we are now watching unfold. Everybody who remembers Bosnia, anyone who remembers Kosovo, anyone who remembers Somalia, anyone who remembers Haiti, um, by the way, all of which could be examples of why we should never do this again, and yet we keep doing this again. <laughs> but is, it, I mean, there's two things, David. There's this a question of global attitudes about America's influence and righteousness but also this question of our ability as a country to influence the outcome of affairs. Do you accept Bob's argument about this? That we have, well, I think we probably differ on how much ability we have. I mean, just, you know, I'm, I, I mean, since Iraq, I've, I went back to my neighbor, my oak shot. Uh, the, you know, the, there's a school of conservatism, which goes back to Burke, which is intention, I think, with a bit of Bob's school, which is based on the notion of epistemological modesty. You just can't know much about the world, and therefore you should be very cautious and incremental in what you can do. And this is not um, pacifism. It's just a, 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 an Eisenhower sense of stewardship more than a, a, maybe a Reagan sense of uh, democracy promotion. And that Eisenhower sense is around in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. The older I get, the more I like Eisenhower. Uh, it's mostly in the Democratic Party these days, actually. The, the Democratic Party has become more an Eisenhower party. Well, there is, but is, there is that distinction about whether uh, America should be a place of kind of uh, you know, pragmatic incrementalism or more activist uh, on the world stage? Well, I don't have time to untangle all of these because, first of all. Oh, we'll make time. OK. No, I'm just <laughs> I mean, the, the affection for Eisenhower is, to me, remains astonishing, other than that he didn't, he, 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 he didn't get us into Vietnam, seems to be his number one claim to fame in the world. Now, if you really want to go back to a foreign policy which consists entirely of 
overthrowing uh, other leaders, including democratically elected leaders, which our presidents now have to apologize for every four or five years, uh, whether it's Mossadegh uh, in Iran or Arbenz in Guatemala, or threatening nuclear war every time somebody does something you don't like. If that's the foreign policy we're looking for, uh, good luck. Uh, I, I, I don't consider Eisenhower a great model of stewardship. And one of the things that he did do brilliantly, which I recommend every president should do, is kick all the really big problems onto his successor. Uh, <laughs> Eisenhower, uh, by refusing to go along with the Geneva Accords, left Vietnam out there as a festering sore that, his next, that the next president was going to have to deal with. And he put together the plan to overthrow Castro, but let Kennedy uh, carry it out. Um, I, I'm sorry. Just don't Eisenhower me. And now, you know. <laughs> uh, but well, I'm. I'm leaving. Yeah. Well, that, I, well, do you I want to say, that? I would say that's that's actually there's some points where you should push it off to your successor. I once did a story about buying a, a castle in France. And the best bit of advice I got was leave... Autobiographical? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was leave dredging the moat to the next generation. Yeah. And sometimes that's actually a good strategy. Maybe Kennedy should have tried that with Vietnam. All right, I, I want to move on, though, out of just the world order and, and, and conflict in the Philippines, although we can certainly come back to that in the Q&A. Um, yeah. yeah, but talk about the, the kind of the economic space. I mean, the thing that I try to reconcile is that in terms of cultural hegemony, if you want to make that point, we do have Apple, right? And that technological breakthrough is all American made, even though it may be manufactured in China. Um, the other piece of that, I, I sat down last week with uh, Jeff Immelt of, of General Electric and Andrew Laveris of Dow and, and Jim McNerney of Boeing. And they were all making the point that, you know, it used to be that if you won America, you won the world. And that's no longer the case. I mean, our big companies, our big manufacturers are increasingly trying to win the world where that, that is the battleground and, and U.S. demand because of slow economic growth is falling farther and farther behind. They're having a lot of difficulty, uh, you know, attracting engineers, dealing with a, with a broken educational system. So in terms of America's economy in the world, um, what is the case to say that we are not in decline? I, I'm, I have to get out of the mode of trying to deny everything, that, every point that everyone's making, <laughs> yeah. so I will not try to do that here. But I think the only honest answer, honestly, the only honest answer is we don't know. Um, the reason I say that is we have gone through this perception of being overtaken many times. It wasn't so long ago that it was the Japanese who were certainly going to eat our lunch economically, and James Fallows wrote books and other people wrote books about the superiority of their model, and they bought Rockefeller Center, and it was over. Um, and the famous line is, the Cold War ended and the Japanese won. Um, and and now, we, no, now it's like hysterical, right? People are laughing, and now we hope the Chinese, I hope the Chinese buy Rockefeller Center too, by the way. <laughs> but so I just want to say we've been through this, this perception before. And I'm, I don't know what the answer is. I don't think anybody knows what the answer is, whether the United States will regenerate itself. I would argue, however, that in the depths of a long recession is not necessarily the time to ask that question. Um, you know, we, this is, we are all suffering from economic difficulties now. That is the, that's what's shaping the mood about everything. But let's at least be aware that we are there, unless we expect to be in a recession for the rest of eternity. Um, you know, we will have a different perspective, I guarantee it, uh, when we pull out of the recession. Um, but yes, China is increasingly important as an economic player. Uh, when you're talking about the rise of the United States or the decline of the United States, you do have to talk in relative terms. It only makes sense in relative terms. So you have to ask yourself, are the Chinese just simply going to march forward without any difficulties whatsoever? Um, that's, that's an economic question. Again, history has pointed out, if you were sitting here in 1987 and Paul Kennedy wrote his famous book on the rise and fall of the great powers, he looked at the United States, he looked at the Soviet Union, he saw two countries in, in total uh, overstretch and gummed up works economically, uh, and the only problem was he predicted the wrong power was going to decline, and the, the Soviet Union collapsed, the United States went roaring forward. Um, other pro countries have problems too, and China has huge domestic problems that they are acutely aware of, and not to mention, as I have said before, if you're talking geopolitically, infinitely greater strategic problems than we have. We have a relatively easy strategic situation. They have a very difficult strategic situation. We have to lose to somebody. 
But, the, point, but the question, David, is are we, it, it's not relative in the sense of uh, there is an absolute there. I mean, in terms of the, the world is changing, technology is changing, is the United States uh, economically prepared to compete in the way that the way has changed in the way that the world demands. Yeah, here I, I can't fake this one. Uh, I actually do think we're ready. I, I don't worry about the fun economic fundamentals. The, where I would worry, and this is more on how economics translates into power, the EU has more economic wealth than the US, but the EU doesn't, is a different sort of global superpower than the US, in part because it's fractured, but in, car, in part because it lacks our creed. And the, so, my doubts would be less about raw economic power, about whether the strength of the creed is strong. Like when you wrote Dangerous Nation, I go back to Bob's big books. Uh, he wrote a book in Latin America that was 47,000 pages, I think, back in the 1980s. I'm, uh, that was after the editing. <laughs> yeah. That was Cliff Notes for you. Uh, the, uh, and, but the, cre the Dangerous Nation, to me, and you wrote the book on this, so you. you it goes back to the fact that not only has, has it been an affluent nation, it's been this creedal nation, the, the idea of the U.S. is the last best hope on earth, which has sooner universal applications, that if inalienable rights are denied to people around the world, somehow that's a problem for us. And so that causes us every five years to go out and, and be bothered by that. I wonder if one could argue that that creed, that I call it an eschatology, a vision of how the world ends, of how history ends, with universal democracy. I wonder if that creed has, is not taught as much or, and is less universally accepted than it used to be and therefore is less propelling as people react to various world crises. Again, I would just say that could theoretically be true. The evidence is not there yet because we are, in fact, reacting in extremely traditional fashion to what was happening in Libya. I mean, the, in a way, I feel like we've already had a test case. We had Iraq in the 2000s. Right. And then we, Bush was thrown out and they didn't elect McCain and they brought in Barack Obama. And then you were able to tell this joke, which is they told me that if I voted for John McCain uh, in 2008, we would uh, attack another Arab country and overthrow another Arab dictator. And they were right. I voted for John McCain and that's exactly what happened. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, who, <laughs> Who would have imagined that Barack Obama, in within a year and a half of taking office, would be doing right. this again? But not only, by the way, with uh, support from everybody except the Republican Party, which is typical behavior yeah. uh, for opposition parties, um, but also with enormous worldwide support. I mean, to me, why, why are we overlooking that particular data point as we look at this? The Europeans, after Iraq, were begging the United States to get involved. The Arab League after Iraq was asking the United States to use its power in Libya. Doesn't that tell us something? I want to come back, though, to this, to this, uh, this competitiveness point, though, because I think as we talk about the economy, we talk about the fundamentals being strong, that's fine. It's still a question of whether America is as well equipped as it should be, as it wants to be, to compete internationally, educationally, particularly with uh, engineers and scientists and our ability to adapt technologically. Yeah, well, that, you would answer that question. Okay, okay. Here, here's, my, here's my answer. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, a, a, because I fundamentally do think we're still Alexis de Tocqueville's country. We still have the highest work ethic among most of the world. And most importantly, economic wealth is generated by the ability to network, to create social networks, to create new forms of corporate and other organization. And we still have a phenomenal ability. We have a huge, even today, high levels of social trust so we can form organizations, we can form Silicon Valley, we can welcome people from around the world with re relatively little friction compared to anybody else. Mm -hmm. If you go to a European football match or to a Japanese baseball game, they are acutely aware of what country people are from. If you ask a kid in Seattle, where's Ichiro, Ichiro from? He thinks, oh, he's American. Mm -hmm. And so we just have that ability, uh, and that's that's going to give us, I think, an advantage for a long time. I do want to address the political class, but I want to get to this question uh, that come to, comes to us uh, via Twitter. Um, why not push for a combined US-EU-China strategy? The US will never find an ally like Europe. United we stand, divided we fall. I, I think it's an excellent point, and we should be doing it. And what in, would that and, look like? Well, it would, I think, it, it would, you know, 
we and the Europeans are the, the major representatives of a liberal international order. And that is true on the economic front, and it's also true on the political front. And we're seeing it played out on an issue like Syria or Libya. Um, and China, and to a lesser extent, well, to a lesser extent just because it's a lesser country, Russia, but, but, but fervently Russia, are pushing back against this liberal order because they're not liberal. Um, and I think we are actually already seeing uh, cooperation between the United States and the EU pushing uh, back on that. Now, we're, we see it, we saw it on Libya where effectively the Chinese and Russians were shamed into going along with it. Uh, I think the Chinese themselves are currently looking a little nervous about the position they're having, they're in in Syria. Uh, so we are doing that. I think we need to do it more e on the economic issues because uh, on the issues that are greatest concern to us, like international property rights, et cetera, if we were doing it together with the EU, uh, instead of competing with each other, which is a natural phenomenon, but if we were more cooperative, we could push back on that. But, but our basic interest is in maintaining a liberal order against a rising power that has a tendency to push against it. Why couldn't, why couldn't they say, well, you, know, you, you guys have this liberal economic order, and in both your regions, uh, you have high levels of democracy, and voters are unwilling to accept the consequences of their choices. And a result, as a result, you're swallowing in debt and falling apart. You see Greece, and you see what's about to happen here. So why should we say, why should we follow your order? Is the prestige of our order uh, in, diminished in their minds? It certainly is diminished in their minds, but the question is, what are the Chinese, where do the Chinese want to go? Um, and it's an interesting phenomenon, of course, that, because of course the Chinese have made themselves wealthy in our order, right? And, and the interesting conundrum is, as they get stronger and stronger, do they maintain this order or do they begin to shape it in a way that looks more like them and thereby destroy it? Um, and so I think that our goal ought to be to continue to say, no, let's be successful in this order rather than distort it in the way that you unfortunately are going to distort it. And that's where I think the United States and the EU can contribute. By the way, for all of the attractiveness of the Chinese model, I don't see many other countries attempting actually to copy it. The only people who think about copying it are other autocrats. Um, and and it's, it's not something that most people are choosing. They'd like the money, but they don't want to pay the price uh, in terms of personal freedom to get it. I want to ask a, another question about our, our, our economic stature in the rest of the world, and it, and it focuses on America's debt crisis. And David, it gets to your column today, which I thought was very compelling, which is the headline was, We Are Europe. Um, the argument right now is about the need for austerity in America to address a, a debt crisis. And then we see the real world example of austerity in countries that have tried it in Europe, where it does not seem to be a friend of economic recovery. Right. Well, I mean, I think there, if you went upstairs and asked the economists here, they would have their consensus, which is we should not do austerity now, but we should commit to serious austerity once the economy recovers. That would be pretty much a consensus. I sort of agree with that. Uh, the question is whether we'll ever commit to that. And that's a two-part question. One is, do we know how to do it? Do we know how to control healthcare spending? I think we probably do not know the answer to that question. Uh, and second, do, are we willing to commit to it? And I would say the answer to that is no. I think the lack of social trust, and here's an element where social trust does kick in, where if you ask people to sacrifice, they think, well, they're just asking me to sacrifice. I'm going to get screwed because everyone else will not be sacrificing. And therefore, that's a severe problem for our political order. And so I think we're going to have a fiscal crisis of the Greek sort sometime in the next X number of years. I remember asking an economist in the White House, do you think we'll get serious about our fiscal situation before we have a crack up? And he said, nah, I don't really think so. <laughs> and so I said, well, how big will the crack up be? Will it be like Greece, Venezuela, or the decline of the Roman Empire? Uh, and he said, well, probably worse than Greece, not as bad as Rome, somewhere in the middle there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so, I sort of think we have, a, I'm very optimistic long term, I think we're in for a rough decade. And that gets to the deficiency of our political class in America. The way I've summed it up is, do we have a political class that's too small in relation to the challenges we face? Uh, we always have a political, almost always have a political class that's too small. I mean, we, the, the giants among us, I think you have to go back to the founders really to find giants, and I'm not sure most of the rest of the history uh, shows up a lot of giants. But, and, and I have to say, unlike, I'm, I 
unlike many foreign policy experts or people who do foreign policy, I'm not going to also try to pass myself off as a domestic policy expert because I don't know how to uh, necessarily address these problems. I do think, in my a amateurish way, that we've had a, w a weird political cycle uh, where uh, the president was elected in, in one kind of atmosphere and has been forced into having to deal with a different kind of uh, problem. Uh, he was elected to get us out of a recession, and then, but then things turned, and it became about the fiscal crisis. So what I'm hopeful of, what I'm optimistic about, is the next election produces either a second term uh, Obama or a, a new president who will then presumably have some kind of mandate to deal with this crisis more effectively. And one of the amazing things about the American political system, I'll just say this, the founders created it to be clunky. I mean, they, it was deliberately a set up so that you couldn't make radical change very easily. Um, and so we are constantly dealing with the clunkiness of our system. And yet, periodically, they have what are called you know, critical elections, realigning elections. I'm not even sure they have to be realigning. But the election produces the possibility of finally breaking through the logjam. And you know, we could be pessimistic that that's never going to happen. And that for the first time in American history, we're not going to be able to solve our problems. But it would be really the second time. I guess the Civil War was the other time. <laughs> but for that's instance, you know, the tariff, if you all remember the tariff problems, right? <laughs> Um, that was a c classic case of entrenched interests, where the parties were locked into a struggle over the tariff, and they couldn't solve it, and they couldn't solve it, and then eventually they solved it, uh, more or less. But this yeah, one well, point if I could yeah. just jump yeah. in on this, because Bob's been citing all these historical continu continuities, or whatever, whatever the word is. But there, in the domestic sphere, and especially in this fiscal sphere, there really are discontinuities. So for example, trust in government. Gallup has, for the last 70 years, asked people, do you trust government to do the right thing most of the time? And it's been 70, 80 percent, decade after decade, till the 70s, and now it's 11 percent. So that's a discontinuity. The second is just our consumption levels. Personal consumption as a percent of GDP, decade after decade, throughout the 20th century at least, was like 40 percent of GDP, personal, de personal consumption, or personal debt as a percent of GDP. It jumps to 133 percent. That's a huge discontinuity continuity. And then the third thing is that every generation has an incentive to push their costs off on future generations and pay for themselves. No generation has done it to the extent that we have until now. So these are three things that are actually are different than the, the centuries of, uh, of the past. Let's get to some questions uh, from the audience. We have a microphone, which we will move around. We'll start there. Yes, sir. You can also shout it out. And My name is Judd Harry, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. My, my question is for David Brooks. You mentioned first that you believe strongly in the degree of social trust we have and the networking powers that we have in our society. Then you mentioned the fact at the top level there's such a paralysis that we will not solve the fiscal problem. Are we skating on a contradiction there? Uh, no, it depends on what you trust. If you trust your, uh, we trust our neighbors really a lot. Uh, and we trust uh, our, our friends, we're really still good, the power of association, the power of uh, creating new social and, and entrepreneurial networks is still incredibly robust. We don't trust our political institutions so much. So I'd say we have a still high degree of social trust and a low degree of political trust, which may be a problem, though in some sense I do agree with Bob on this, I do think that's our historical normal and the period after World War II was the anomaly period. Meaning that the, because this, the, the power of the individual and our, 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 our self-sufficiency is distinct from a, a real backlash, Bob, against major institutions. We have been through that before. I mean, during Andrew Jackson against the banks and, and, and government. Again, is this just historically cyclical? I, you know, I, again, I don't know. My, my prejudice is yes, that we go through these periods. Um, it's not surprising, as, as you just indicated, that after getting out of the Great Depression, after World War II, um, that there would be a tremendous confidence in the ability of government to do things, which, which, which you know, lingered on until, but it was absurd, it was an absurd confidence, right? I mean, it was an overconfidence. So, um, but throughout much of American history, as you said, there wasn't that kind of confidence. I, again, I'm just, I, I, I would love, you know, at some point, we'll, when we get out of the recession, 
let's have another conversation about this because when, nothing's, when things aren't working, it feels like nothing can work. Um, and maybe David is right, and I, can, I don't have an argument against some of these cyclical problems um, other than to say uh, the United States has, in fact, in the past, had to confront serious crises that required sacrifice by the people and that people have made the sacrifice. Yeah, only one sentence. In the Great Depression, the social reaction was not like it is now. There was an increase in social trust during the Great Depression, an increase, a decrease, in, 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 uh, a weaving together of the social fabric. It was very different than now. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask Mr. Kagan a question. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Kagan a question about uh, China and U.S. relations. And something that kind of bothered me during the visit of uh, Vice President uh, Xi Jinping is that the recent pivot uh, that the President has talked about going with Asia Pacific. And quite often, there was almost kind of this dismissive attitude of why are the Chinese kind of paranoid and suspicious about our, and, and I found that a bit strange considering you even said today that the last 30 years we've had interventions covertly or militarily in Central America, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, North Africa, and South Asia. And now in recent diplomatic agendas with uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, and so on and so forth, Australia, wouldn't, if, if it was the shoe was on the other foot, wouldn't the United States be a bit skeptical, a bit suspicious about uh, the intentions of China if, if we were kind of dealing with the same situation and, and our foreign ministry was looking out the world saying, what's really on the Americans' minds? Why, why are all these things taking place? And our own recent history, as you mentioned, of these interventions, I, I think the Chinese have a certain degree of, uh, of justification of what exactly are we up to in the Asia-Pacific region? Uh, they have complete justification. I mean, there, there's nothing for them not to be paranoid about. We don't say it because we're in a you know, we, we want to maintain friendly relations, but they know and we know that we are engaged in containing a certain kind of Chinese behavior which they consider to be their right. Uh, they consider it to be their right to be the dominant power in the region. They consider it to be their right to be in control of the South China Sea, and we are saying, no, you can't. Um, now, because there's no absolute justice in the international system, there, n neither of us are right or wrong. Uh, and in fact, the only question is, and this is the question, again, getting back to this argument in the book, which is what kind of world order do we want? We can have a world order where China is the regional hegemon. That would be a very natural kind of world order, historically very natural. I think it will be a much worse order for many more people, including Americans, than the present world order in which they're not uh, that kind of hegemon. So, and I think the potential costs of moving to that kind of world both in terms of potential conflict and crises, both in, ter in terms of even the e economics, could be very high. So it's not that the Chinese are wrong. They're right. Um, but it's our job to try to steer them in the most productive direction for this world order. And what I mean by that is to steer them in the direction of economic growth and ultimately political change. I'm going to just end by one point. If, if I were a Chinese strategist and I wanted to say, what is the best way to ensure that we actually can become one of the world's leading powers? I would say, let's democratize. Because I think one of the main things that's holding China back today in the world is the fact that it's this kind of autocracy. If China became a democratic country, then we would have a, I would start having a different conversation. They would be a much more powerful, in my view, I welcome that challenge, but they would be a much more powerful challenge. Comment, David? Uh, my only comment is, I think Strobe and you, we were in Moscow, at least I was visiting, you were living, Strobe knows this better than I. My memory is that in the 90s, we had a debate whether China or Russia was doing it better, and a lot of smart people thought Russia was doing it better. <laughs> uh, and so why should the Chinese think democracy is their answer? They're not going to, they're no, the, the, the leadership definitely doesn't think that, so you don't have to worry about them. <laughs> they're not going to be seduced yeah. into that argument. Back to the audience, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I write the Mitchell Report. And um, I want to ask Dr. Kagan, um, I went back, I, I did what David Gregory does on Sunday, which is that I, I went back and looked at the, the last thing you said, which is to say the earlier book, uh, uh, The Return of History, End of Dreams. And you, that, that book begins with a sort of satchel page uh, notion of don't look back because the autocrats are gaining on us, and ends with an admonitions from both Morgenthau and Niebuhr about the need to uh, uh, to maintain power. So uh, w w in, in looking at the, at the close of this uh, book, which I, I, I really do think is a powerful book, particularly in a genre that has a lot uh, of competitors that are very sort of 
dogmatic or pedantic or prescriptive, et cetera. You, you do say that, that one of the things that we need to do is sort of focus on those three pillars. I wonder if you could just take a couple of seconds to tell us what that looks like, why that's important, and what that would do for us uh, at this point. To focus on the three pillars of, of, of military power, economic order. Are you talking about the three pillars of the order? Yeah, you say politics, economics, yeah. and security. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, that's, a, that's a large question. I don't know how, whether I can answer it sufficiently. But, but this is actually, this, this raises an interesting uh, juxtaposition because over the last two years, I would say, we've been in a terrible economic strait, right? And China has been humming along. Um, and so by any measure, if you were looking at just economics, you would say China should be up and we should be relatively down. But one thing that's happened is that China in the South China Sea and the East China Sea overplayed its hand, uh, pushed a little too hard, made everyone nervous, and made everyone come uh, going to the United States and looking for some kind of support. So that what's actually happened in Asia uh, over the past couple of years is that America's stock has gone up and China's stock has gone down. Uh, they may recover, they may get smarter again, uh, but right now, that's the situation. So it, it, it's a, to me, it's an interesting example of how not everything is about economics. And, and I would say that what the United States did in this situation, and I am saying positive things about the Obama administration uh, on this, which is getting me into all kinds of trouble, um, is that we shored up a major, you know, one of those pillars of the international order. Because imagine if when China, China presented this challenge, made everyone else nervous, and our response was, I'm sorry, we're nation building at home. Not, we're opening a new base in Australia, we're coming out and being more active diplomatically, uh, we're, we're, we're pivoting in your direction. Our response was a very traditional American response, even in the midst of all this malaise and unhappiness, et cetera, et cetera, and it made a big difference. Um, and by the way, how we deal with what goes on in the Middle East, how we respond to Iran, will make a big difference um, in terms of this world order. So that, that's kind of what I mean. I'm, I'm focusing on the power element, obviously. Um, and, and, and by the way, don't get me wrong. We, we need to get our economic uh, house in order, as people say. And I'm not, I'm not you know, sanguine about our ability to do that. But as we do that, and this is where I think it's important. We can't neglect this other element of maintaining the international order that we've created. Can I ask one quick question, Can, which is Obama loves you, listens to you. Romney, you nominally work for, advise in some <laughs> yeah. way. Uh, yeah, is this a sign you know. that there's actually less discord on foreign policy in this election than past elections? Well, look, I mean, this is the great problem, is that in elections, everybody tries to sharpen the differences. And there are differences. And I could, go, I, I could easily give a critique of uh, the Obama administration uh, starting with they are not pushing back enough on the defense budget issue, which I think is so important. I think they should not have pulled out of Iraq uh, completely so quickly. I'm nervous about what they're doing in Afghanistan, et cetera, et cetera. But that having been said, American foreign policy is, has been remarkably consistent, and it hasn't mattered that much which party was in power, which president was power, and Obama is proof of that. Do you, I mean, just as a one detail here, uh, we're coming to the end of this guy's first term, and Guantanamo is still open, and there's no prospect now of closing it. Now, that's not really a foreign policy issue, but it's kind of a foreign policy issue. And I, you could go down the list. Um, you know, the, 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 the generally militaristic element of the drone war that he's conducting, um, and, his over, and this shift to Asia, this pivot, which is very strategic and very traditional. Um, so yeah, we get the shift is 10 degrees one way, 10 degrees the other way. Sometimes those 10 degrees are really important. And I think, uh, I think ultimately foreign policy comes down to the big decisions that one would take and the other wouldn't. I mean, if Al Gore were president, we probably wouldn't have gotten into Iraq. I wonder about that. You wonder about that. I do. On the other hand, you know, this notion that that's somehow this binary choice that it's war in Iran with Republicans and not with this right. Democratic president, I don't buy that since uh, I think there's a lot more consistency there. Sir. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Peter Shutley from Brookings. And on a superficial basis, it's easy to say we're where we are. We have the biggest economy. We have the strongest military power. But I'm wondering if the foundation underneath those aren't eroding away in two ways. 
One, and this is an article you wrote, David, maybe two years ago or so. I'm not sure when, 30s, 40s, 50s, the US had a huge educational lead in terms of the educational level of the American workers. That has eroded. We're now in, I don't know, number 20 or something. Secondly, our economic basis back then was dominating manufacturing around the world. We were way up there. Now we dominate software. And my question is, that is so quickly changed. Look at MySpace. It was a big deal a few years ago. Who hears about it now? Facebook could disappear in a nanosecond five years from now if somebody comes up with something else. So the foundation for our economic strength, I ask, isn't as solid as it was in the past. So don't at least these two trends, education, base of our economic strength, underlie causing concerns? Yeah, I would say one out of two. Uh, the, the, there's a great book called The Race Between Technology and Education by Katz and Golden, on, and it's on the education point. Our education is still improving, but it, it's not as fast as our technological demands are improving, and other countries have surpassed us. So that, I think that is real. The shift from manufacturing to service doesn't particularly bother me. We're, a, we're still a very strong manufacturing economy. Our total output is flat as a share of, of GDP. We're really good. We just don't employ people. We just use robots instead of people. But the shift to a more service-oriented economy or a more software economy plays to our strength, not to our weakness. There's a school of national economics where they take national culture seriously, which most economists are loath to do. And one of the, the arguments in this school is that the Germans, for example, are really good at perpetual gradual change, incremental progress, which is a sort you need if you're going to do metallurgy. But we're really good at disruptive change. We can create a Silicon Valley out of nowhere. And so if you get software, if MySpace is disappearing and Facebook is appearing and Facebook is disappearing and Tumblr or whatever is, is appearing, then that's something we're good at. And so to me, that's not a source of concern. Let me do one more question out of the audience. Uh, yes, ma'am, on the corner. Yep. I'm Sally McNamara from Georgetown University. It seems to me that the euro cannot continue in its current form, and certainly I expect some sort of collapse or some nations to leave. What magnitude of order of effect do you expect? Do you think it will be a Roman Empire or just something <laughs> minor? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 this is something I think about. I, I expect. See, he thinks about. <laughs> we lived in Brussels together. I mean, you should think about this. I do think about. Uh, it. I wonder narcissistically what the effect will have on, and I do everything narcissistically, uh, what the effect it'll have on the US political debate. Because the European model has been a powerful model. And whether it's an EU collapse or just Greek flaking off or just a long period of austerity, the prestige of that model is going to decline. That's the long term. And then the short term is just whether, I mean, my view is Angela Merkel has more to do with Barack Obama's reelection than he does. Uh, and so I do think that's, uh, that's the short-term problem. Uh, but the long-term problem is A, is a the dec decline of the European model, and second, is just a shift, and we've noticed this, a shift away from attention of Atlantic attention toward Pacific attention, that going faster and faster and faster. We're going to leave it there. I want to point out, for this is Meet the Press at Brookings, and from a, from a programming point of view, I make decisions on the fly. I was going to talk to Rick Santorum on the program Sunday. I now feel we need to spend a little bit more time <laughs> with opposing views on the war in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> focus on that a little bit more strongly and then get into some of the politics. Uh, it would be a lot more interesting. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> But, uh, Contraception in the but Philippines. It, and then after we do that, we'll, we'll still get to Rick Santorum if you're watching on Sunday. <laughs> Thank you both very much, and the conversation will continue. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much for doing that.